This show is sponsored by MyOliveLeaf.biz, MyOliveLeaf.biz. Due to some violent content, parental discretion is advised. All right, guys, right now you are listening to the voice of Valerie Denise Jones. Thank you so much for hanging out. I was hella busy yesterday and totally missed International Women's Day. International Women's Day 2020. So if you're a woman out there and you're listening, happy belated to you. All right, so I want to celebrate a woman. Her name is Amanda Seals. We don't always agree. Most of the time we do not, but she said something that was very pivotal. um, And it is because I wear so many hats that I want to celebrate her because quite often I am described as the same person that she speaks of in her book. And I hate it. And I know that like Lonnie Love, It is because I am a woman of a darker hue and, you know, shoot, it's just our reality. I don't know. Black women, angry black woman syndrome, yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. All right, here we go. So first off, I want to ask you about a passage in your book. You specifically wrote- My book got passages. I know, I know. (laughs) Wait, wait. What's your feels like right now, first off? I'm freaking out, but we're doing a show, so it's fine. Oh, okay. It's fine. So it's fine. I want to know about that passage where you said how to get your point across without being labeled as an angry black woman. So tell us about that. What's that passage specifically about? Well, I think it's less about, like, how to do it and not be labeled that, but how to know that, like, there's some times where you're going to be labeled that regardless yeah. of what you do yes. because of the stigma attached to a black woman speaking her mind, mm-hmm. right? And the reality is, is never forget, it was illegal for us to read. Okay, so I always remind people of that because when we now live in a world where black women are educated, where we're 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 employed, we're independent for a lot of people, that's like, whoa, what are you doing? And so at the end of the day, I get a lot of people who will ask me, Amanda, like, I'm very I'm very uh, vocal with my thoughts. I'm very clear. I'm very sharp. And people take that as me being an angry black woman. I say, well, one, if you're a black woman and you're conscious you are naturally going to be angry. Like, yeah. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's a lot to be angry there's about. A lot there's a lot to be that angry still about. Dusty and, you know, yeah. James Baldwin said that, and, uh, you know, I paraphrase, but that's a fact. At the, sec- at the same tone, though, the fact of the matter is that some people will try and call you angry to diminish the value of what you're saying. Right, exactly. Ooh, there's a little exactly. mind manipulation Let right there. Yes, and so... The truth is, is that a lot of times I feel like people are more interested in the tone of what you're saying than what you're actually saying. And with black women, I think that we get the brunt of that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And what you really need to focus on is the fact that you got to be true to yourself. And I think that there is something to be said with knowing the nuance of how to speak in certain spaces and learn for yourself that, you know what, it ain't about learning how to be phony. It's about how to find a new way of being real. Yeah, yeah. That's why your book because it's revealing so much with diversity. Me being on this show, I am a curvaceous, dark-skinned woman who happens to have a deep voice. I have a a, a mellow baritone voice. (laughs) Come on, Barry. So, you know, when I speak, sometimes people, you know, you see the comments. She she seems so negative. She seems seems so like a bully. I'm I'm the sweetest person out there, you guys. It's just that because of who I am, the way I look, you got to get over it. I'm not changing for nobody. Get over it. Yes. You know? They be trying to say, oh, you know, Lonnie hating on you. I'm like, y'all don't understand. Me and Lonnie see eye to eye. We know All what it is. Long. All day long. This is my we sister. Know what it is. Yes. All of these are my sisters. We know and, what you it know, is. a lot of times when we sit at the table, you know, um, I'm listening to you all. And I have a resting bitch face, right? <laughs> I'm like this. You gotta hold it. You gotta hold oh it. my god! And uh, I'm listening. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I've tried to work on it, y'all. Seriously, I have tried oh, to really? work on my face. Why? So, because I, I sometimes I do look at myself like, dang, why yeah. you? Because sometimes I. If what I, am I always telling you? You like fix your face. face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but Lonnie's like, I didn't know there's nothing to fix. Yo, and, and I didn't, but, out. but sometimes I do because, like, okay, say, okay, I'm gonna try to like. Like, look, sympathetic. I'll be like, <laughs> oh, God. Don't do it. Don't do but it. But listen, I get that because I be trying to hire. I be trying to, like, make my voice higher. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, because I got a deep voice, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I say happy birthday, and people are like, you're attacking me. I can't <laughs> All right, guys. That was Amanda Seals. Big shout out to her. Kudos regarding her new book. And Lonnie Love. 
Sister girl, I feel your pain. Being of a darker hue ain't always easy. I promise you it is not, especially when you're out here on this grind and you are a solo act trying to do every darn thing. Yeah, you get the titles and it's really, really sad that people do that to us. But anyway... Guys, I'm getting ready to patch you into a previously recorded broadcast featuring Dr. Boyce Watkins. Had a great time with him doing a pre-show, and he will be joining us very, very soon on the Judge Show Round Show. So stay tuned for those deets because he's coming soon. All right, guys, let's get started. Here we go. Amanda Seals is a weirdo. Like, I mean, but she's exactly the kind of person they would put on shows like The View and The Real because those shows are all bullshit anyway. I also think with Oprah, um, you know, her, I think, I, I think her attacks on black men are coming from a deeper place where, uh, you know, you're sitting on $3 billion and you have all this trauma that came from the fact that black, many black men in your life were not good to you, all the way from the men who raped you to the man that used to smoke crack with you and then threatened to tell everybody that you were smoking crack uh, back in the 1990s. And so, ultimately, Oprah is dealing with demons. And Oprah, uh, I believe, has a deep-seated issue with the black man. Uh, it's no different from, you know, the, the way The Color Purple, that movie was made, where they slant against the black man to sort of position the black man as, as the eternal enemy, uh, which unfortunately undermines the stability of the black family. So, uh, Oprah is, um, she's sick. She's sick. Her and Gail are just sick. If you listen to the way Gail talks about her ex-husband, her ex-husband was an assistant lieutenant governor or something like that. And when Gail was asked about her husband, all she said was he's a cheater. She didn't say he's a great man who disappointed me. She didn't say, well, things just didn't work out. She didn't say I loved him. He was a wonderful person. And we were both, you know, we, we just didn't decide not to be together. No, she said he's a cheater. She dehumanized him into this one-dimensional creature who was no good for anybody, even though he's a very accomplished human being. So that's kind of what the black man deals with all throughout society. The black man is seen as the cockroach of America. And so it's up to black men, first and foremost, first and foremost, to step up and to make sure that we say, we don't care what you think about us, but we're going to tell you what we think about ourselves. And then we're looking for the black women, the real black women, not these fake-ass, weak-ass, punk-ass women on shows like The Real and The View. I'm talking about the real black women who love black men, who love their fathers and their brothers, their husbands and their sons, who step up and say, no, these are our men. We're going to work to build them back up. We're going to hold them accountable, but we're also going to make them strong and, and encourage them to be strong in the face of adversity. And that's how you build a strong community. Radio d- 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 DJ. One Nation, one station. What's going on, guys? I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins from DrBoyceTV.com, and you're listening to me on the Judge Joe Brown Show, produced by Valerie Denise Jones. <laughs> All right, okay. let's move on. So nothing like a talk with your mama to mm-hmm. set you straight. Snoop Dogg admits he had a talk with his mom, and now he is apologizing to Gail King. Here's the new video. Two wrongs don't make no right. When you're wrong, you got to fix it. So with that being said, Gail King. I probably tore you down by coming at you in a derogatory manner based off of emotions and me being angry at questions that you asked. Um, overreacted. I should have handled it way different than that. Uh, I was raised way better than that. So I would like to apologize to you publicly for the language that I use and calling you out of your name and just being disrespectful. Ooh, you know, we've all been a little lit, a little mm-hmm. too crazy, and popped off on somebody and left our voicemail and went d- and did all of this. Yep. And then the minute the dust settles, you're like, Ooh, when you Ooh I cannot believe that. Dr. B, that is the end of the audio clip. It um, kind of disturbed me a little bit and presented a bit of a difficult conundrum. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Um, back during slavery, one good way to keep the black man uh, as a little boy and to keep him weak and feminine was to find the biggest, strongest big dog on the plantation and basically break him down in public. Take a big, strong man, like maybe a big Snoop Dogg, and break him down into a little boy or into a very weak, feminized beta male who's humble, apologetic, looking down at the ground with his tail between his legs. That's how you train the little boy slaves to let them know you don't ever want to try to be a man, not while the white man is around. 
Snoop Dogg did not want to make that apology. Snoop Dogg's apology was the result of the fact that both he and Gail King are two Negroes who are owned by Viacom. Viacom writes checks for both of them, and somebody made him apologize. He also knew that he was going to lose a lot of white money if he continued to try to stand up against white supremacy. In fact, I was shocked that he made his original statement in the first place because most black folks in Hollywood, I don't care how gangster they come off or pretend to be, they don't have the courage or the ability to stand up against white supremacy in that way. So I would have preferred that Snoop had remained quiet or had just made a subtle statement of support of Kobe and Vanessa. The fact that he tried to get gangster when he wasn't in a position for this kind of, of economic, spiritual, and psychological warfare means that the community takes a net loss. The community loses because the big dog got turned into a little puppy in front of everybody. So I was very disappointed in the apology, and I wish he'd never made that statement in the first place. All right, Dr. B, um, you know I mentioned earlier I have a clip by comedian Gary Owens that I want to play for you. Um, And also I'm reading questions and comments in the chat room, so forgive me if some of the questions I proceed to ask are a little bit redundant, but I'm asking both questions I want to know the answers to as well as our listeners. But uh, as it relates to Snoop Dogg, I definitely applauded him for using his celebrity, his platform to speak out against a known enemy. So I hear what you said, and you said that you kind of sort of wish that he hadn't said anything at all, but should we not applaud the fact that he did concert effort? Yeah, I think that people were proud and applauded the fact that he stood up, but sometimes you get an endorsement that you don't really want. It's like if Donald Trump's running for office, he wants he clearly wants all the white people to endorse him. But if David Duke stands up and says, me and the KKK love President Trump because he's going to make America white again, he might say, okay, you can sit your ass down. But the problem was he chimed in the wrong way. When he got to that point where he called her a B, I knew we were in trouble. When he started talking about, uh, we going to come get you, I said, they, they going to come get him. That's what's going to happen. He ain't coming to get nobody because he's a celebrity. He ain't coming to get nobody. He just That's just talk. But I knew they would come get him. And so when you heard Susan Rice stepping in, you know, Susan Rice is not a regular person. Susan Rice is deep state. Susan Rice has, connect, Rice has connections to the FBI, CIA, NSA, and all these other organizations that have oppressed black people for years that have organized assassinations. Uh, Susan Rice knows people that could probably get Snoop Dogg destroyed in public. Uh, by all they got to do is find some accusers of something that he's done. I'm sure there's something somebody doesn't like about him that's happened in the last 25 years. And then they can also get him sent to jail for, for 50 years, have him looking like Bill Cosby. So when Susan Rice stepped in, that to me was a direct result of the fact that you made a physical threat. And, and again, you know, I know Snoop has always talked about being a gangster, gangster this, gangster that. Well, if, if, I mean, if, given that he's got this gangster thing, I hope that he understands G's moving silence. Gangsters moving silence like Lil Wayne said, like, like uh, the G is silent like lasagna. You know, the word lasagna, the G is silent. So ultimately, if you're really going to get somebody, which I don't, believe that that was necessary but if you're really gonna go get somebody you don't announce it on instagram you just go get them and i just kind of feel like snoop got carried away with his words and i understand that he might have made a mistake but we also must accept the fact that it was a net loss for us because some people just ain't really built for black liberation on that level you know i don't know if, if a person who makes a 20 million a year from white people is really prepared to make the sacrifices necessary to uh, battle against white supremacy. I just don't know if he's that guy. So, honestly, I wish he just kind of settled through his support behind it and then remained silent. All this extra talk, it, it only hurt the whole conversation. Dr. B, someone in the comment section asked if you, as a black man, were offended when Snoop Dogg called a black woman the B-word. I felt that it was unnecessary. Um, uh, I felt that it was also not just unnecessary, but it shouldn't have come from him. Remember, Snoop Dogg became famous with the most famous phrase in his whole career was, we don't love them hoes. Snoop Dogg is the guy who came to an award show with two women on a leash 20 years ago. Snoop Dogg built his whole career off the degradation of the black woman. And so for him to come out and make that remark about Gayle King, I just thought, I said, my gosh, it's, it's almost like 
you're a cop and you've got a suspect who's been molesting children in the neighborhood. You, you caught them red handed. You got them on video. You got all the evidence you need. The case is open and shut. And another cop comes in and punches the guy in the face for no reason. Well, that's going to get the, the charges dropped. That's going to, because what you've done is you've shifted the blame and shifted the narrative. So now Gail King, who is a criminal in the black community, Gail King should be incarcerated for the way she has attacked the image of the black man and has really gone out of her way to engage in false and defamatory attacks on black men in public uh, on behalf of her white uh, overseers. Gail King is a criminal when it comes to black people and what we're trying to accomplish. So, and, and we had her charged guilty. We had an open and shut case on Gail for what she did. Snoop got the charges dropped. Gail King gets to walk away scot-free. Gail gets to claim that she's the victim. Gail gets all this support. And now nobody's talking about the crazy shit that Gail did in the first place. And that infuriates me. And, 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 and think about this, too. Susan Rice, nobody's checking Susan Rice for the fact that she threatened Snoop Dogg. You know, again, nobody cares about what's happening to the black man. Everybody wants to believe the black man is only capable of being a predator. Dr. B, from the bottom of my heart, I just want to say, as a black woman, I do not think that black men are cockroaches. I think that you guys are beautiful creatures. I applaud you. You are our kings, our twin spirits, our head of household. So I lift you up in the highest honor, those of you who are deserving of it. I definitely do. So I want to make sure that I go on the record saying that because I love my black man. Now, as it relates to this other black man, Snoop Dogg, it really, truly did not shock me that Snoop Dogg was using predatory language. I mean, I know that he sings gospel music and he's, he's an executive, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but that predatory language is pretty synonymous with his persona. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here for just a little bit and say, I, I just wasn't shocked that he used that kind of rhetoric. Um, I, w- I was a little bit shocked because 2020, you know, it's not 1995. In 1995, people were okay with that kind of thing. 2000 people were okay with that. In 2020, you're, you're, not ra- you're not on a rap song. You're engaging in important, meaningful political diet, you know, uh, 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 political commentary. You know, so the language has to shift. And, and, and I thought that Snoop, you know, he, he's not a 24-year-old. He's, he's almost 50. So I thought that Snoop had, had evolved. I, I was actually surprised. I didn't expect him to call her a doghead. But I, I just didn't expect that. And, and talking about we, oh, we gonna, before we come get you, I, I just, you know, I don't think any of that was necessary. You know, I, I thought that he understood the purpose of, of the mission of the conversation. Like if, you know, if, if there was a, a, you know, if there's a porn star who supports Martin Luther King, she doesn't show up to the church rally uh, ready to, you know, do sex on tape. You know what I mean? Like, like she leaves that stuff behind to show respect for the movement and what it represents. All right, we are almost at the end of the first quarter. I appreciate your brutal honesty. I definitely do. And I just want to ask you a question before we wrap, you know, this portion of the session. Um, As it relates to social media, do you think that quite often we get a little too comfortable when we go live because we're in the comfort of our own home, our own environment, and we forget and or are not cognizant of the fact that we are addressing hundreds, possibly thousands or millions of people. So, you know, we forget that people are listening. I don't know where it came from. I mean, he could have been smoking and drinking and whatever. He could have been high when he made that video. I, I don't know. All I know is that when you're speaking to 20 million people, uh, it's, it's, it, the black man has to be strategic about what he says and to just know that you're, you're going to be held accountable for your words. And I assume Snoop would not be as successful as he is had he not being thoughtful and strategic about the direction of his life and his career and his reputation. So um, I guess people get relaxed. I mean, I'm sure people tweet while they're drunk. You see the president of the United States saying crazy stuff on Twitter with typos and everything else. But I personally, honestly, I don't have a lot of respect for that because I believe the black man has to be strategic and intelligent. And you can't be out here sloppy or you're going to get slaughtered by white supremacy. All right, that officially wraps the first quarter. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyce Watkins, for hanging out with me today during today's pre-show. Guys, if um, you are listening, we are doing a pre-show because uh, we're trying to 
figure out how to uh, get Dr. Boyce Watkins and Judge Joe Brown on the line at the same time. Currently, Dr. Uh, Boyce Watkins is on tour doing his thing, and Judge Joe Brown has been making a few appearances per uh, our schedule. So, um, yeah, we're going to figure it out and bring him on in the very, very near future. So stay tuned for those updates. All right, so as it relates to the show, I am about to play an audio clip, an audio clip um, that is just a reminder. And it's not because uh, I, I felt I needed a, a white guy to remind us of our special powers when we stick together. It's just that it is a reminder that other people are listening, that they're watching, that they're watching. And so we just need to be mindful of that. No matter how we proceed, good, bad, or indifferent, we are being watched. Anyway, here's the clip. Comedian Gary Owens. You! Hey, has anybody else noticed this past week and a half what's going on in the world? This shift in energy? I felt it. Between, let me tell you something. Since Kobe passed away, between Ari Shafir and Gail King, I just want people to realize what can happen when black people really come together? Because black people is like, look, you ain't talking about Kobe. You ain't talking about our hero. Kobe's a worldwide hero. Italian, China, white, black, Latino. That's a hero, but it's extra because he's a black guy. So black people are like, you ain't, you ain't talking about our black hero. Ari Shafir didn't value. He didn't value that what black people bring to the table. Gail King didn't realize, don't be, don't be bad-mouthing Kobe. I just want people to realize how powerful, I want, and this is coming from a white dude, how powerful black people are when they come together. Notice this past week, Ari Shafir got dropped by his agency, comedy clubs have canceled his gigs, Gail King felt obligated to wake up this morning and the first thing she did was address the questions about Kobe to Lisa Leslie. Why? Because black people came together and were like, we ain't having this. Mm -mm, you ain't slandering our boy's name. Not like that. I'm just telling you, I know it. I felt it. Black people aren't mad at me. I'm, I'm good. Black people aren't mad at me and I felt <laughs> I felt the venom uh, just online and in my bones. I felt it, man. I'm just saying, notice, black people, the power you have when you come together on something. I notice it. I feel like Gail King probably feels like she's on the playground, she's in third grade, and she said something out of line, and every black kid at the school surrounded her at recess. And was like, what'd you say? What'd you say? That's our favorite teacher. You don't talk about our favorite teacher like, you don't talk about Mr. Bryant. No, Mr. Bryant's cool. I'm just saying, I noticed it. Uh, when black people come together, all battles will be won. W-O-N. I'm telling you, I've noticed this past week. Strong. Dr. B, I'm going to toss it to you. What are your thoughts? Um, I thought he was right. I thought it was a nice thing to say. Um. You know, it doesn't become any more special just because a white guy said it to me. Uh, you know, but um, I appreciate his support for what we're doing as black people and the changes that are occurring in, in society. And, and I do see him as uh, as somebody who could be, could be perceived as a white ally. Um, I don't think a white ally is as valuable as a, as a true black ally. But I, I appreciate the sentiment, and uh, and he was right. Uh, he, he was making one basic basic point that when black people come together, we can do almost anything. And and I and I've I've made that point every week on my podcast. You know, um, first thing I say is, you know, when when I introduce people to Doctor Boyce TV, is I say this is the home for intelligent black people. And then we talk about the fact that black people need to educate our own children, create our own jobs, and support black businesses. And we throw that black core of three out there at everybody because we understand what black folks can do when we do come together. Uh, and right now we still have to work on that because what happens is that because we're not t as together as we could be together economically uh, and otherwise, uh, we're giving away a lot of resources to a lot of people who understand our power. They understand what how much money $1.3 trillion is. 
and they are able to extract most of that uh, in a multitude of ways, which I won't go into now. And so, uh, if, if, if you know, I guess if, if for some people, if they need to hear a white guy say it for them to believe it, that's fine. But uh, I say that every single week. All right, Dr. B, I appreciate that answer. I want to take advantage of the last few minutes that I have to spend with you. Um, this clip, this audio clip is per Amanda Seals and Lonnie Love. I love those two women. I think they're very intelligent, very beautiful women, uh, physically and spiritually. But sometimes I don't always know how to digest the things that they have to say. Here we go. Chicago politics is ruthless, okay? They and this, I'm telling you, this is more about Kim Fox and that situation than Jesse. They're just using Jesse as a kid. Come on, y'all. It was no victims. They can't really prove it. Thank you. Everything was, was Even if it was up. a hoax, even if it was a hoax, this is really happening all the time. And even if it was a hoax for the sake of bringing attention to this, then I'm like, that's low-key noble. Like, I'm just at, I'm at my wit's end <laughs> about us censoring situations like this and wanting to make people have to pay. And it's like Emmett Till's accuser was a lie. It's, I think she's still alive. Yep. Yes, and yes. This young man died, and she announced that she was lying about it. They should have put the shackles on her that day, and she's walking around. So no one was hurt in this situation. Nobody, you know what they're mad about? Their time, their resources being and the used, money, the taxpayers, sure, resources, sure. Be, taxpayers' resources are being used every day to imprison people who have done nothing but be an addict. So I don't want to hear about Jesse Smollett. Okay, but so what I do you about people that feel that, well, what if a hate crime really happens to me, and now because of what Jesse Smollett this, did, now if, they don't believe if me? This is, if this one instance yeah. is what makes them not believe you, baby, that's a lie that they're telling ourselves. We have lived in a nation where they don't believe hate crimes every day. Every single day. Sure, sure. But, but I just want to ask, Jesse's I, not I, I just want to ask, because Jesse is the, it, like, it, it, it is huge nationwide news because he is famous. So yeah. if it was a hoax, what do you think is the correct punishment? And do, or do you think he should be They punished? got murderers on probation, Gina. Sure, sure. But I'm asking about Jesse Smollett. I'm asking about that because you said it was low-key the, noble. I just it literally understand. should be like, He should oh, be applauded? Damn. Oh. They got smacks on the wrist for all these people, and they can't give a smack on the wrist to Jesse Smollett? Uh, like, because they're saying that it's a whole big thing? I'm just, I, I don't believe it. Sure. And we look at black men who are constantly getting the books thrown at them all the time. All the time. All that time. Okay, well, you know, in terms of Amanda Seals, um, you know, she she's just, I, I, it's a little bit of a um, an irony to me to, for her to hear her speak on behalf of black men when I saw what she did, um, you know, has done publicly, for example, in the situation with Dr. Myron Roll and, and, um, and really seeking to kind of say things that uh, really almost come off a little bit crazy. Um, and I, I thought it was really kind of, I couldn't help but laugh when she said that she felt that Jesse Smollett's um, hoax was low-key noble. Uh, I, there's nothing noble about a liar. There's nothing noble about that. There's nothing noble about uh, a, a person uh, who, who, you know, in a country where there's allegedly all these hate crimes happening, he has to go make one up, and he's doing it mainly because he's trying to get a pay raise or whatever he's trying to do. Um, I, I think that, you know, what we have to decide on the Jesse Smollett situation is we've got to decide – are we going to have a conversation based on politics or are we going to have a conversation based on truth? Are we going to, are we going to talk about this from a political perspective or are we going to talk about this from an honest and truthful perspective? So if you want to have the political conversation, here's what you do. You do what Amanda did. You say, oh, it's no big deal. Um, you know, there are hate crimes being committed everywhere. There are people that lie all the time and they don't get punished. And so let's not punish Jussie. Okay, I get that. But the problem with that is that if you have that political conversation, you say that about Jesse, then that means you need to say that about anybody who goes out. If, if some MAGA hat wearing redneck goes out to the police and says, um, a black man robbed me today, and they find out that he lied about it, then you got to let him go too. You know, if he goes out and he says something that, if it's, some, if it's, if it's, if it's an, somebody who's not an ally of yours, so you know, because Jesse's her ally, Jesse's liberal, he's, promoting the LGBT crap and all this other stuff, whatever it is, you know, and I'm not saying it's all crap, but I'm saying it, it, I don't like it being shoved down my throat. Um, you know, then, then, yeah, it's like, oh, let him go. It's no big deal. Kind of like how the Democrats overlook uh, Bill Clinton's rape accusations 
but they talk all day about Donald Trump's rape accusations. I'm like, well, Bill Clinton and Donald Trump are kind of the same guy, you know, like in a lot of ways, at least when it came to the women, like they were the same guy. So what, what, how are you applying one standard to Clinton and another standard to Trump? Oh, because it's political. Uh, I tend to look at it in, in a way that I, 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 what I perceive to be more based on truth. Uh, what Jesse Smollett did was wrong. Uh, Jesse Smollett undermined the ability of real legitimate victims to have credibility when they actually do report hate crimes. Uh, Jesse Smollett uh, reflects the fact that liberals like to be fucking dramatic and they like to act like the whole world is falling apart and that anybody who voted for Trump must be a, a car carrying Klansman. And they know that's not true. So they, so people got to go make things up. You know, when Jesse uh, did that, uh, did that crime, when Jesse did the hoax, I was in Chicago. I live in Chicago. That night, it was so cold that I didn't even want to go into my garage because it was like negative 20 degrees below. I knew he was lying from the minute that the report came out because we were saying, like, who in the hell would be out in this weather? I, it, it, I, it has never, it's rarely ever been that cold in Chicago. So, you know, so we knew he was lying. And then the whole story about, oh, they were wearing MAGA hats, and they said, aren't you that nigger from Empire? And, and the news, I mean, all of it was like out of some sort of, white liberal fairy tale you know and, and and it wasn't real it's not it doesn't it doesn't reflect chicago and it doesn't re reflect reality so you know look i think jesse should be punished should jesse go to jail no I don't, I don't think he should go to jail uh but i think he should pay whatever the cost was to investigate that crime he needs to pay a big price for that plus a penalty uh i think that the people that just let him go and, and out of the blue dropped all the charges i didn't like any of that uh, and, and so I think at the end of the day, um, what the man did was wrong, and it was really messed up. And I think they need to own up to that. Snoop, Jussie, and Gail are actually all linked in the sense that all these stories link to uh, the common theme of black economic weakness and what, might, what some might consider status or clout-chasing behavior. Uh, if you think about it, Gail King got that $11 million contract from CBS because she, she did, went out of her way to tear a black man down in public with that R. Kelly interview. Um, I don't like R. Kelly. I don't agree with a lot of things he's done. But I, I found it just ironic that you're focusing on R. Kelly when you got Harvey Weinstein out here and all these other people, all these pedophiles in Hollywood uh, that she's not saying a word about. Right? So, so basically she's their Negro hitman. That's what Gail is, and Gail's made a lot of money from that, and Gail's got a lot of status in white circles for behaving in inappropriate ways. Snoop? was trying to protect his money, Snoop, uh, because Snoop does not obviously apparently have uh, a, a strong enough ownership stake in the various entities that he's a part of to be able to withstand pressure from white Americans. Uh, you saw Snoop fold in a way that we've never seen him fold in the last 25 years. We've never seen big Snoop Dogg come out with two apology videos uh, because the first apology video wasn't good enough. Um, you know, a real gangster, a real strong black man doesn't have to apologize for shit. Uh, it, it, you know, you can apologize at, uh, under your own uh, volition, but not because somebody's making you do it. Uh, I believe he was economically threatened and probably threatened in other ways. Uh, Jesse Smollett was status and clout chasing by, you know, creating the whole hoax so that he would be able to label himself as the victim and the gay Tupac and all this other stuff that he was calling himself <clears throat> because he, he was desperate to get another job. He's desperate to uh, maintain his status in Hollywood, uh, which is not owned by black people, and he's also desperate uh, to put some money in his pocket. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, what you're really seeing is the, the fact that black, when it comes to these major uh, media outlets and, and, and media-based companies, black people don't own these things. Uh, we, ju we just don't. We don't have a lot of power there. So when you're powerless and desperate, you start to behave like a crackhead. You know, when a crackhead doesn't control his own supply of crack, uh, then he ends up looking very weak, uh, especially relative to the pusher. The white man is the pusher. The white man is pushing the drugs of fame onto us. He's pushing the drugs of economic success onto us, and we're becoming addicts, and we don't control our own supply. And so, therefore, uh, you, you become extremely vulnerable to the demands of your kingpin. And so in that situation, if you are a crack addict and you find yourself acting like a buffoon, in order to get more crack, doing things that degrade you in order to get access to your drug, uh, making your, yourself look ridiculous, embarrassing your family just to get access to more crack. You got two choices. You can either, one, get off the drug altogether, detox yourself so you're not 
getting on your knees for your for your your drug pusher every time you need some some blow, or if you are going to stay addicted to the drug, you need to find your own supply. You need to find a way to grow it in your own backyard. You need to find your own connect down to Columbia. Whatever it is you got to do, one or the other. Make a choice. Either get your own, either control your supply or get off the dope. So for black folks, when it comes to money, when it comes to our economic standing. We are addicted to money. We love money. We worship people who have money, which ultimately leads us back, right back to worshiping the white man because our lack of interest in ownership, our lack of interest in investment, our lack of interest in developing meaningful capital and institutions that sustain us puts us in a position where we are extremely vulnerable because he controls the very commodity to which we have become addicted. So the only liberated black people in this country are going to be twofold. They're either going to be people that have detox themselves from the drug they don't need the white man's money they may not be rich but they, they ain't out here begging for a job or they are wealthy people who have found a pathway to ownership of the resources that impact their lives those are the only two liberated black people in america that's why i did not really want people like snoop dogg really even interfering in this conversation because when it's time to go to war with the white man no slaves are in, invited it doesn't mean snoop's a slave i'm not dissing him like that i'm not trying to be nasty to him nothing like that but if you're not in a position to fight, then you probably need to sit on the, on the sidelines and let other black people fight this battle on your behalf. All right. So you brought up Gail King's name again. So I want to double back real quick before we wrap. Um, as it relates to Oprah Winfrey crying live on air. I really truly believe that her tears were genuine when she feared that social media goons would actually harm her BFF. So my question to you is, do you think that from this point on that Oprah and Gail will maneuver just a tad bit different, very, very different um, from the ways that they have done uh, the past few decades? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know what they're going to do in the future. I, I I hope that they're smart enough to change their behavior. I don't know what's even driving the behavior in the first place. Um, I don't. I I have to say, I I um, my view is that Oprah really wasn't afraid. That Oprah knows how to use Becky tears to get sympathy because if you obtain the moral high ground of victimization then that allows you to be the greatest predator of all. I mean, the greatest predator is typically somebody who's able to be viewed as a victim uh, because you can throw rocks and nobody can throw rocks back at you. So I believe that Oprah's uh, crying was strategic. Um, I believe it was done in a way to shift to shift the narrative. Um, I believe Gail and Oprah have always had security because they've been billionaires for 30 years or whatever, 25 years since the 90s. So this idea that suddenly Gail has to have security sounded kind of ridiculous to me because uh, I have security and I'm not anywhere near as rich as Gail. So I thought that was hilarious for her to say Gail has to get security now because I would assume Gail always has security. Um, now, you know, with that said, um, you know, are they going to change their behavior? I don't know, but I think at the, same, at the very least, we have to let CBS know that we're not going to tolerate that kind of behavior. And so in terms of, you know, my shifting the narrative in the black spaces that it, within which I operate, I said, look, this is bigger than just going after Gail King. You really want to go after CBS because what white supremacy likes to do, what the man likes to do when he's sort of controlling his black puppets and creating Negro fights, because like, that's what Gail is. Gail doesn't get to do all the all-inclusive stuff on CBS. She does. She gets in the Negro fights is they like to sort of position us against each other and then sit back and hide their hands and act like they had nothing to do with it. And so uh, my argument is that by calling on out CBS for their behavior, then you're actually going more to the core and to the source of what actually created that framework in the first place. Because if CBS got on the phone and told Gail to cut it out, Gail cuts it out, right? So uh, ultimately, I think it's a matter of going after these institutions. Same thing. If Stephen A. does something ridiculous on ESPN, I'm not just going after Stephen A. I'm going to go after ESPN. Uh, if a rapper says something in a song that doesn't make any sense, I'm, I'm not going after the rapper. I'm going after the record label. So, so I personally think that we, as, as a community, have to be more strategic in terms of who we uh, see as the real uh, opponent in these battles. Um, you know, I think that there is a little bit of a reality check in the sense that Oprah and Gail, they're kind of like, uh, it's a, a little bit like... Um, Game of Thrones, uh, at the you know at the end you know when you have the elite 
thinking that they're safe and protected from the real battle. Um, they think that they can oppress uh, the poor and kind of keep them outside the gates. And now the, the, the marginalized people, we now have missiles too. So if you're the queen and you're sitting up and you've issued some order that's led to the slaughter of thousands of poor people and you think it's not going to affect you, well, if one day you're sitting there at breakfast and it's all quiet and wonderful and then suddenly a missile slams into your castle and rocks the foundation of the building that you're in, it does create some type of alarm. you know. And I think that Oprah Winfrey and Gail King were used to launching mis- missiles at the black community and nobody firing back. And so when people start firing back and you've got people out here that have massive platforms that are coming at you, um, I think that that probably is a little bit of a shock to them. You know, uh, you know, you got the, the, the people on the, you, you got the celebrities, the, the 50 cents and people like that. And then also, if you think about this, I mean, I've got probably 4 million people I'm able to reach through social media. Willie D has hundreds of thousands of people, maybe over a million. David Banner, you've got Tariq Nasheed, you've got uh, a lot of people that have platforms where when we all combine, Vicki Dillard, when we're all on code and we all combine our message and we shoot a missile back at you, you might feel that shit. You're going to feel that. So I think that that's what you're seeing. You're seeing the black elite grappling with how they're going to deal with this populist uprising that's occurring uh, in the community. You see the Democratic Party struggling to say, wait a minute, we can't just go lie to black people and give them you know, some nonsense to get their vote. We actually have to earn it now. So you're, you're just seeing them sort of adjust to that. I also think with Oprah, um, you know, her, I think, I, I think her attacks on black men are coming from a deeper place where, uh, you know, you're sitting on $3 billion and you have all this trauma that came from the fact that black, many black men in your life were not good to you, all the way from the men who raped you to the man that used to smoke crack with you and then threatened to tell everybody that you were smoking crack uh, back in the 1990s. And so ultimately, Oprah is dealing with demons. And Oprah, uh, I believe, has a deep-seated issue with the black man. Uh, it's no different from you know, the, the way The Color Purple, that movie was made with a slant against the black man to sort of position the black man as, as the eternal enemy, uh, which unfortunately undermines the stability of the black family. So uh, Oprah is, um, she's sick. She's sick. Her and Gail are just sick. If you listen to the way Gail talks about her ex-husband, her ex-husband was an assistant lieutenant governor or something like that, and when Gail was asked about her husband, all she said was he's a cheater. She didn't say he's a great man who disappointed me. She didn't say, well, things just didn't work out. She didn't say I loved him. He was a wonderful person. We were both, you know, we, we just didn't decide not to be together. No, she said he's a cheater. She dehumanized him into this one-dimensional creature who was no good for anybody, even though he's a very accomplished human being. So that's kind of what the black man deals with all throughout society. The black man is seen as the cockroach of America. And so it's up to black men, first and foremost, first and foremost, to step up and to make sure that we say, we don't care what you think about us, but we're going to tell you what we think about ourselves. And then we're looking for the black women, the real black women, not these fake-ass, weak-ass, punk-ass women on shows like The Real and The View. I'm talking about the real black women who love black men, who love their fathers and their brothers, their husbands and their sons, who step up and say, no, these are our men. We're going to work to build them back up. We're going to hold them accountable, but we're also going to make them strong and, and encourage them to be strong in the face of adversity. And that's how you build a strong community. You cannot expect that you can go out here and build a strong black community and not have white people come and try to destroy it. It's completely against their interest to see black families come together or black communities get strong. It's against their interest to see black economics come together in a way that is productive and positive. So they, they want the black man to be under their umbrella, under their feminist LGBT umbrella, but they want the black man to be feminine and they want him to be gay. They do not, and they want him to be a beta male. They do not want a black man who is a masculine alpha male because that is defined as toxic masculinity. And that's Oprah's M.O. Oprah, if you are a gay black man, Oprah loves you. If you are a feminine black man, Oprah loves you. If you are a punk-ass little beta male uh, who lets white people tell you what to do, Oprah loves you. But if you're masculine and you are a leader and you're shaping uh, the future of the black community, and you put black people first in an unapologetic way, Oprah has a hard time digesting that because I think that she associates um, alpha males with rapists and predators. And, and you know, and, and I mean, and that, I guess maybe that's her experience. I don't know. But what we must also understand is that it is the alpha males that, 
become the Malcolm X's and the Marcus Garvey's and, and the Martin Luther King's. <clears throat> so we cannot allow them to create a narrative where they want to shape our alphas and make them into betas. And even if you look at uh, uh, Martin, Malcolm, and, Gar- and Marcus, if you look at those three men, three alpha, strong alpha males who led the community, every single one of those men has been, uh, has been hit in the, in, that, in the way that I just described. Uh, they wanted Marcus Garvey. They, they put Marcus Garvey in prison. Uh, you know, a lot of your, al- your black alpha males are put in prison they, because, because basically an alpha is a threat. It's, it's frightening, so you exterminate him. Prison is one form of extermination, so they lock Garvey up. Uh, Martin Luther King, you have people running around talking about his, his issues with women. Uh, well, you know, well, you know, he cheated on Coretta, blah, 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 right? <clears throat> so then they're, tar- so they're, they're start trying to make his alphaness into something toxic, right? And then uh, Malcolm, you saw guys like Mark Lamont Hill trying to question whether or not they believe Malcolm was gay. So, so it's, it's sort of like as a black male, you have to have the ability to defend your masculinity. And as much as we want to get upset and complain and say this ain't right, white people are doing this to us, we, we have to understand as we look at ourselves, not just look at what, what the white man is doing. White folks are going to keep on being white. We need to look at ourselves and understand that, you know, that, that that's the definition of being an alpha, is that an alpha doesn't need to have somebody allow him to be an alpha. You know, no differently from the way, um, you know, the, uh, the, the Kansas City Chiefs didn't get permission to take the Super Bowl away from the 49ers. Alpha takes his alphaness. He, he must fight for that, right? And, and people see the idea of taking something or sticking your claim as something that is toxic and negative, and we know that it's not. Uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's completely fine and positive if used in the right context. If it's used for the sake of protecting and supporting those you love, then alphaness is a beautiful thing. But if it's used in a predatory fashion, it becomes a negative thing. And they tend to see an alpha black male as predatory because ultimately if you're an alpha black male and you put your family first, you put your community first, then, then basically you become, uh, you become a pretty scary adversary because you ultimately are going to end up going to war with white supremacy, and that, goes, that puts you in direct conflict with the interests of the people that have made uh, trillions of dollars profiting off the black community for the last 400 years. So uh, I'm not asking for anybody's permission to be, uh, to be an alpha. I don't uh, look for white people to approve of what I'm doing. I don't uh, ask them to send me a permission slip to give me the right to speak. I don't look, I don't care if they don't like what I say. I don't sit around and think about these things. I just go out and I just play the game and I fight hard and I fight for the people I love. And that's what you have to do, period. Wow, that was powerful. Dr. B, could you please look at your watch and tell me if you've got six more minutes to spend with me? Yes, I do. Absolutely. I, and, and it's funny, I do have exactly six more minutes, <laughs> maybe seven. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for saying yes to me. Um, so, so let's spend the last six minutes doing a recap. What do you want people to get out of today's audio? And please include Monique. Monique warned us of Oprah, so I would absolutely love to hear what you've got to say about that. Um, uh, in terms of Monique, uh, Monique has always had an axe to grind with Oprah, um, and I understand that. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, ideally, though, I think that she just didn't seem to quite understand, you know, that that's the world you were entering into, and that's the kind of trade off Tyler Perry and and Lee Daniels and all these other people make in order to be successful. So I think Oprah, excuse me, uh, uh, Monique is still dealing with that. Um, I'm really happy for her because she's, uh, she seems to be learning the value of, of, of building her own. And uh, she came on my YouTube channel, and I love her to death. And, uh, and, and so when I see somebody who goes through something like that and they're talking about how they were victimized, it, it makes me think about what I would probably say to one of R. Kelly's ex-girlfriends. You know, that, that little girl that's running around now, she's trying to snitch and work with the feds because – she, you know, when she was defending R. Kelly on national TV, I would probably say to her and say, like, but you knew you were making a deal with the devil. Like, like you, maybe, you know, I wish I could have talked to you before you even sat down with that man or decided to get with that man because, you know, you're choosing a life. And when you choose that life and go that path, there's going to be a price to pay. And, you know, and, and so nobody's surprised that you're now having regrets about the choice that you made. So, um, so with Monique, I, I side with Monique. Um, I, but I, I, I just see it as, yeah, of course, you know, uh, it's almost like that, that black person in your office who tries to convince you that racism isn't real and tells you that you're too black because you, you know, because you're complaining about the racism and you need to stop. And then one day something racist happens to them and they suddenly turn into Malcolm X, 
you know, like they suddenly are like pro black everything. And, you know, and, and, and it's, and you kind of look at the person like, yeah, well, I told you they were racist a long time ago. But for some reason, you thought you could make this damn thing work. You know, so I feel bad for Monique. I feel like Monique um, was a little misguided in terms of even thinking that these people uh, were normal people. When I look at uh, Lee Daniels and Oprah and all them, I don't look at them as normal people. They're not normal people. All right, Dr. B, that's it. Uh, This was fun. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I learned a lot. My notepad is full, which means I took a bunch of notes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I text Jester Brown, let him know that we just wrapped. And I just wanted to ask you, in honor of Judge and in honor of the show, can we, um, I'd like to have you back. And then also, too, uh, do you have anything you'd like to say to Judge Joe Brown? Well, um, yes, you can get us together. Um, And uh, also to Judge Brown, I just want to say that I have so much respect for you because uh, we don't have a whole lot of masculine black men uh, that are in the public eye. Uh, You know, people like yourself and Dr. Claude Anderson and uh, Louis Farrakhan and a few others, um, I I admire you because, um, uh, you know, a man can't look up to a punk. And I don't care if I agree with you or disagree with you. One thing I know for sure is that you ain't no punk. And uh, and I and I, I respect that because my daddy wasn't no punk, and I think we got too many punks out here in the black community. And that's why our community's losing. So, um, so I like Judge Joe Brown. I, I, I don't care what I don't care what I don't care what you say. Even if I'm thinking, man, that sounds crazy. I can't believe you said that. It don't matter. Uh, I'm an ally for life, and that's just the way it's going to be. Period. Um, I, I really enjoy being on the show. Um, I have so much respect for what you guys are doing, and I want us to continue to fight. I want us to. Uh, have a stronger community and it's going to be stronger when we all keep, continue to stay on code and stick together. And everybody's also invited to come to the black business school, the black business com. If you want to learn about wealth and economics and everything else, you can actually get started for free. It's better than college, but it's free. So uh, feel free to go check it out. All right, guys, that's it. That wraps um, the pre-show. Appreciate you so much for hanging out. Big shout out to Dr. B again. Congratulations also. He's getting married this summer, July. I think that's when he said during the interview. So again, a big shout out to him and his significant other. All right. So if you got any questions, guys, please meet me down in the comment section. As always, I love you to life. Please like, share, subscribe, tell a friend who will tell a friend about this show. Please do that, guys, because we got to get the word out, and I need your help doing that. Hit the like button, hit the like button, hit the like button. Also, join me on Instagram. I just recently reactivated my Instagram account, and my ID is Valerie Denise Jones, Valerie Denise Jones, or MS Valerie Denise Jones. Go over there and hit a few like buttons as well. All right, so that's it. Have better than a great day. We'll talk soon. Bye. Today's show is sponsored by My Olive Leaf. Please visit myoliveleaf.biz to shop for olive leaf extracts, which will assist your efforts to transform your life, detox your body, increase your energy, get restful sleep, and rid your body of antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal properties. Do not delay. Contact the MOL reps today. Please visit myoliveleaf.biz for their full line of olive leaf extracts and Moringa products. Oh, yeah. For those of you who would like a personal consultation, please call the MOL reps at 612-567-3263. Also visit their website and social media pages for the latest on sales, new releases and more. Have a great day. See you in the comments section.